Book 8. The battle swayed by Zeus dawn in her saffron robe came spreading light on all the world, and Zeus who plays in thunder gathered the gods on peaked Olympo's height, then said to that assembly, Listen to me, immortals, every one, and let me make my mood and purpose clear. Let no one, god or goddess, contravene my present edict, all assent to it that I may get this business done, and quickly. If I catch sight of anyone slipping away with a mind to assist the Danans or the Trojans, he comes back blasted without ceremony, or else he will be flung out of Olympos into the murk of Tartaros that lies deep down in underworld. Iron the gates are, brazen the door slab, and the depth from hell as great as heaven's utmost height from earth. You may learn then how far my power puts all gods to shame. Or prove it this way, out of the zenith hang a golden line and put your weight on it, all gods and goddesses. You will not budge me earthward out of heaven, cannot budge the all-highest, mighty Zeus, no matter how you try. But let my hand once close to pull that cable, up you come, and with you earth itself comes, and the sea. By one end tied around Olympo's top I could let all the world swing in mid-heaven. That is how far I overwhelm you all, both gods and men. They were all awed and silent, he put it with such power. After a pause, the grey-eyed goddess Athena said, O Zeus, highest and mightiest, father of us all, we are well aware of your omnipotence, but all the same we mourn the Achaean spearmen if they are now to meet hard fate and die. As you command, we shall indeed abstain from battle, merely, now and again, dropping a word of counsel to the Argives, that all may not be lost through your displeasure. The driver of cloud smiled and replied, Take heart, dear child, third-born of heaven. I do not speak my full intent. With you, I would be gentle. Up to his car he backed his bronze-shod team of aerial runners, long manes blowing gold. He adorned himself in panoply of gold, then mounted, taking up his golden whip, and lashed his horses onward. At full stretch midway between the earth and starry heaven they ran toward Ida, sparkling with cool streams, mother of wild things, and the peak of Gargaron where are his holy plot and fragrant altar. There Zeus, father of gods and men, reigned in and freed his team, diffusing cloud about them, while glorying upon the crest he sat to view the far-off scene below, Achaean ships and Trojan city. At that hour Achaean fighting men with flowing hair took a meal by their huts and armed themselves. The Trojans, too, on their side, in the city, mustered under arms, though fewer, still resolved by dire need to fight the battle for wives and children's sake. Now all the gates were flung wide and the Trojan army sortied, charioteers and foot, in a rising roar. When the two masses met on the battle line they ground their shields together, crossing spears, with might of men in armor. Round shield bosses rang on each other in the clashing din, and groans mingled with shouts of triumph rose from those who died and those who killed, the field ran rivulets of blood. While the fair day waxed in heat through all the morning hours missiles from both sank home and men went down, until when Aelios bestrode mid-heaven the father cleared his golden scales. Therein two destinies of death's long pain he set for Trojan horsemen and Achaean soldiers and held the scales up by the midpoint. Slowly one pan sank with death's day for Achaeans. Zeus erupted in thunder from Ida, with burning flashes of lightning against the Achaean army, dazing them all, now white-faced terror seized them. Neither Idomeneus nor Agamemnon held his ground, and neither Ias held, the tall one nor the short one, peers of war, only the old lord of the western approaches, Nestor, stayed in place, not that in fact he willed to. No, one horse had been disabled by Alexandros, whose arrow hit him high, just at the spot most vulnerable, where the springing inane begins. The beast reared in agony, for the point entered his brain, and round and round he floundered, fixed by the bronze point, making havoc among the horses. While the old man hacked to cut away the trace horse with his sword, amid the rout Lord Hector's team appeared and the car that bore the fierce man. Soon enough, old Nestor would have perished in that place, had not diamonds of the great war cry seen Hector coming. With a tremendous shout he tried to rouse Odysseus, and called to him, where are you off to, turning tail like a dog? Son of Laetz and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, someone's lance might nail you from behind between the shoulders, God forfend. Hold on with me to fight this wild man off the old man's back. Odysseus did not hear him, as he ran far wide of him and seaward toward the ships. Then, single-handed, Diams joined the melee forward of the old man's horses and called to him, in a piercing voice, Old man, they have you in a bad way, these young Trojans. Age bears hard on you, your strength is going, your groom is wobbly and your beasts are spent. Here, mount my chariot, and see how fast the horses are in the line of Troes, they know this Trojan plain and how to wheel upon it this way and that way in pursuit or flight. I had this team as booty from Aeneas, and they are masters at stampeding troops. Let the men take over yours, while we too drive these on the Trojans. 
Hector will find my spear is mad for battle, like his own. Lord Nestor of Gerenia, master of chariots, did not refuse, his team was taken in hand by Sthenelos and noble Euromedon. Boarding the car alongside Diams, Lord Nestor took the reins and whipped the horses forward until they came in range of Hector, as Hector drove upon them at full speed, then Diams made his throw. He missed his man but hit the charioteer, Eniopius, a son of the Bios, hit him squarely just beside the nipple so that he tumbled backward, and his horses shied away as the man died where he fell. Now a cold gloom of grief passed over Hector and anger for the driver. Still, he left him and wheeled to spot a replacement, but his team would not be driverless more than an instant, for soon he came on Archeptolemos, Iphito's son, and took him on, giving him reins and horses. Now at the hands of Diams there might soon have been a ruin of Trojans, irreversible rout, an Ilion crowded like a shepherd's pen, had not the father of gods and men perceived it. Thundering he let fly a white hot bolt that lit in front of Diam's horses and blazed up terribly with a sulphur fume. The team quailed, cowering against the chariot, and the flashing reins ran out of Nestor's hands. His heart failed him, and he said to Diam's, give way, now, get the team to pull us out. Do you not realize that power from Zeus is being denied you? Glory goes today to Hector, by favor of the son of Kronos. Another day he may bestow it on us if he only will. No man defends himself against the mind of Zeus, even the ruggedest of champions. His power is beyond us. Diams, lord of the war cry, answered, all that you say is right enough, old man. But here's atrocious pain low in my chest about my heart, when I imagine Hector among the Trojans telling them one day, Diams made for the ships with me behind him. That's the way he'll put it. May broad earth yawn for me then and hide me. Nestor said, Ari, Diams, keep your head, what talk? Even if Hector calls you a coward he cannot make them think so, Trojans or Dardans, no, nor the Trojan soldiers' wives who saw their fine men in the dust, dead at your hands. Then Nestor whipped the horses into a turn and joined the rout. With a wild yell behind them Hector and his men let fly their spears and grievous arrows in a shower, and Hector towering in his bright helmet shouted out, O Diams, once Achaean skirmishers gave you the place of honour. Heart of the roast, cups brimming full. But they'll despise you now, turned woman, after all. You empty doll, ride on. Never will I give way to you, and never will you climb hand over hand upon our ramparts or load our women in your ships, you face your doom from me. Hearing this, Diams hesitated and had half a mind to wheel his horses, face around, and fight. Three times he put it to himself, three times from Ida's mountaintop great Zeus who views the wide world thundered, as a sign to Trojans that now the tide of battle swung to them. And Hector could be heard among them shouting, Trojans, Lycians, Dardans. Fighters all. Be men, friends, keep up your driving power. I know now that Zeus has accorded me victory and glory, and the Danan's bloody defeat. What fools, to build that wall, soft earth, no barrier, it will not stop me. Our horses in one jump can take the ditch, but when I reach the decked ships, one of you remember to bring incendiary torches burning, so I can set the ships afire and kill the Argives round them, blind with smoke. Then he spoke to his team, Tawny and Whitefoot, Dusky and Dapple, now is the time to pay for all that delicate feeding by Andromache, the honey-hearted grain she served, the wine she mixed for you to drink when you desired, before me, though I'm her own true husband. Press the Achaeans hard, give all you have, and we may capture Nestor's shield whose fame has gone abroad to the sky's rim, all in gold they say it's plated, crossbars too. Then too remember the enameled cuirass worn by Diams, crafted by Hephaistos. If we can take these arms, I have a chance to drive the Achaeans aboard ship tonight. While he appealed to them, Queen Hera tossed with Rancia and indignation in her chair, making mighty Olympos quake, and said into Poseidon's ear, oh, what a pity. God of the wide sea, shaker of the islands, are you not moved to see Danans perish who send so many and lovely gifts to you at he like an a guy? You had wished them victory. If only we who take the Achaean side would have the will to fight, to repel the Trojans and keep Zeus away, there he might sit and fret alone on Ida. But the earth shaker growled at her in anger, Hera, mistress of Babel that you are, what empty headed talk is this? I would not dream of pitting all the rest of us against Lord Zeus. He overmasters all. That ended their exchange. Meanwhile, below, and inland from the ships, the strip of shore enclosed by moat and rampart now was thronged with chariots and men, rolled back by whirlwind Ars Pier, the son of Priam, as glory shone on him from Zeus. And soon he would have set the ships ablaze, had not a thought from Hera come to Agamemnon, to rouse himself and rally his Achaeans. Along the line of huts and ships he came, holding a purple cloak in his great hand, and stood beside the black wide-bellied ship of Lord Odysseus. 
Midway in the line this ship was placed, one there could send his voice as far as Telamonian Iascamp at one end, or Achilles at the other, for these had drawn their ships up on the flanks, relying on their valour and force of arms. Agamemnon's harangue reached all his troops, shame, shame, you pack of dogs, you only looked well. What has become of all our fighting words, all that brave talk I heard from you in Lemnos, when you were feasting on thick beef and drinking bowls abram with wine? Then every man could take on Trojans by the hundred. Now we are no match for one of them, for Hector. He will set our black ships afire, and soon. O oh Father Zeus, what great prince before this have you so blinded in disastrous folly, taking his glory and his pride away? And yet no altar of yours did I pass by, not one, in my mad voyage this way in the ships. On every one I burned thy flesh and fat, in hope to take wall Troy by storm. Ah, Zeus! Grant me this boon, let us at least escape the worst, do not allow the Trojans to crush the Achaeans as it seems they will. The father on Ida pitied the weeping man and nodded, his main army should be saved. And Zeus that instant launched above the field the most portentous of all birds, an eagle, pinning in his talons a tender fawn. He dropped it near the beautiful altar of Zeus where the Achaeans made their offerings to Zeus of omens, and beholding this, knowing the eagle had come down from Zeus, they flung themselves again upon the Trojans, with joy renewed in battle. Of all Danans as many as were crowded there, not one could say he drove his team across the moat and faced the enemy before Diomedes. Far out ahead of all, he killed his man, Agelaus, Fradman's son. As this man wheeled his chariot in retreat, the spear went into him between the shoulder blades and through his chest. He toppled, and his armor clanged upon him. After Diomedes came the Atreidae, Agamemnon, and Menelaus, and then the two named Aias, jacketed with brawn, then came Idomeneus and his lieutenant Meriones, peer of Inyalios, the god of slaughter. After these Euripilos Euaemon's son, and ninth in order, two crows, his bow bent hard and strung. He took his stand behind the shield of Telamonian Aias, and Aias would put up his shield a bit, beneath it the archer could take aim, and when his shot went home, his enemy perished on the spot, while he ducked back to Aias flank the way a boy does to his mother, and with his shield Aias concealed him. Whom did he hit first? Orsilocos and Orminos, Arphalestes, Ditor and Chromios and Lycophones, Amapaeon Polyamonides, Melanippos, one after another he brought them down upon the cattle pasturing earth. And Marshal Agamemnon exulted to see him slash the Trojan ranks with shots from his tough bow. He moved over nearby and said to him, Two crows, good soldier and leader that you are, that is the way to shoot. Your marksmanship will be a gleam of pride for the Danans and for your father, too, for Telamon. He reared you at home despite your bastard birth, now distant as he is, lift him to glory. And I can tell you how the case will be, if Zeus beyond the storm cloud, and Athena, allow me ever to storm and pillage Troy, I pledge a gift to you, next after mine, a tripod or a team with car, or else a woman who will sleep with you. To this the noble Teucros answered, Agamemnon, Excellency, I am doing all I can, no point in promising things to cheer me on. As long as I have it in me I will never quit. No, from the time we held and pushed them back on Ilion, I have watched here with my bow for openings to kill them, eight good shots I've had by now with my barbed shafts, and all on target in the flesh of men. But that mad dog I cannot hit. So saying, he let one arrow more leap from the string in passionate hope to knock Lord Hector down. He missed once more, but did hit in the chest a noble son of Priam, Gorgithian, whom Castianera of Asim bore, a woman tall in beauty as a goddess. Fallen on one side, as on the stalker poppy falls, weighed down by showering spring, beneath his helmet's weight his head sank down. Then two crows, aiming hard at Hector, let an arrow leap from the string, and yet again he missed, this time Apollo nudged its flight toward Archeptolemos, driver to Hector, as he came on. It struck him near the nipple. Down he tumbled from the car, his horses shying back as the man died where he fell. A gloom passed over Hector for his driver, but angered as he was he left him there and called out to his brother, Kebriones, to take the reins. As he did so, Lord Hector sprang out of the glittering chariot with a savage cry, picked up a stone, and ran for two crows in a fury to strike him down. Out of his quiver the cool archer drew one more keen arrow, fitting it to the string, but even as he pulled it back Lord Hector cast the rough stone and caught him on the shoulder just at the collarbone, that frail crossbeam that separates the chest and throat. A tendon snapped, the archer's arm went numb, he dropped on one knee, and his bow fell. Now great Aias, seeing his brother fallen, threw himself forward to give him cover with his shield, and Machistius and brave Aeliaster, two of Aias' men, reached under him groaning toward the ships. The Olympian again at this put heart into the Trojans, and straight into the moat they drove the Achaeans, Hector, elated, leading the attack. 
you know the way a hunting dog will harry a wild boar or a lion after a chase, and try to nip him from behind, to fasten on flank or rump, alert for an opening as the quarry turns and turns, darting like that, Hector harried the long-haired men of Achaia, killing off stragglers one by one, and when the main mass had got through the stakes and ditch, many had perished at the Trojans' hands. Now at the ships they tried to stand and fight, and shouted to each other, calling out with hands held high to all the gods as well, as Hector drove his beautiful team around them, blazing eyed as a gorgon, or as ours, bane of men. But Hera, looking down, was touched by the sight and said to Athena, daughter of Zeus who bears the storm cloud, can it be that we'll no longer care for the Danaans in their extremity? All is fulfilled to the bitter end, they are being cut to pieces under one man's attack. No one can hold him, the son of Priam, in his battle fury, adding slaughter to slaughter. Grey-eyed Athena answered, death twice over to this Trojan. Let him be broken at the Argive's hands, give up his breath in his own land and perish. My father, now, is full of a black madness, evil and perverse. All that I strive for he brings to nothing, he will not remember how many times I intervened to save his son, worn out in trial set by Eurystheus. How Heracles would cry to heaven! and Zeus would send me out of heaven to be his shield. Had I foreseen this day that time he went down, bidden by Eurystheus, between death's narrow gates to bring from Erebos the watchdog of the lord of undergloom, he never would have left the gorge of stakes. Now Zeus not only scorns me, he performs what that he wills, she kissed his knees, she begged him to give back honour to that stormer of towns, Achilles. But in time to come he'll call me dear grey eyes again. Harness the team for us, while I go in to get my battle gear in Zeus hall. Then let me see if Hector in his flashing helm exults when we appear on the precarious field, or if a certain Trojan, fallen by the shipways, gluts the dogs and birds with flesh and fat. Hera whose arms are as white as ivory attended to her horses, their heads nodding in frontlets of pure gold, the eldest goddess, Hera, daughter of Kronos, harnessed them. Meanwhile Athena at her father's door let fall the robe her own hands had embroidered and pulled over her head a shirt of Zeus. Armor of grievous war she buckled on, stepped in the fiery car, caught up her spear, that massive spear with which this child of power can break in rage long battle lines of fighters. Hera flicked at the horses with her whip, and moving of themselves the gates of heaven grated a rumbling tone. Their keepers are the hours by whom great heaven and Olympos may be disclosed or shut with looming cloud. Between these gates the goddesses drove on. Zeus, looking out from Ida, terribly angered, roused his messenger, Iris of Golden Wings, and said, Away with you, turn them around, allow them no way through. It is not well that we should come together in this battle. But if we do, I swear I shall hamstring their horses' legs and toss the riders from their car, the chariot I'll break to pieces, not in ten long years will their concussions from that lightning stroke be healed. Let Grey Eyes realize the peril of going into battle with her father. I cannot be so furious with Hera, she balks me from sheer habit, say what I will. At his command his emissary, Iris, who runs on the rainy wind, from Ida's range went up to Grand Olympos. At the gate of that snowcraggy mountain, where she met them, she held them back and spoke the word of Zeus, where are you going? Have you lost your minds? The son of Kronos does not countenance aid to the Argives, here is the penalty he threatens to impose, and will impose, your horses he will cripple, first of all, then toss you both out of the chariot and break it into pieces, not in ten years can what you suffer from that lightning stroke be healed. So, grey eyes, you may learn the peril of doing battle with your father. With Hera he cannot be so furious, her habit is to balk him, say what he will, but as for you, you are a brazen bitch if you dare lift your towering spear against him. When she had finished, Iris departed swiftly, and Hera said to Athena, very upsetting. I cannot now consent, I am afraid, that we make war with Zeus over mankind. No, let them live or die as it befalls them. Let him be arbiter, as he desires, between Danans and Trojans. It is due his majesty. And she turned the horses back. Then acting for the goddesses the hours unharnessed those fine horses with long manes and tied them up at their ambrosial troughs. Against the glittering wall they stood the car, its tilted pole upended, and the goddesses rested on golden chairs amid the gods, with hearts still beating high. Now Father Zeus from Ida to Olympos drove his chariot back to the resting place of gods. For him the illustrious one who makes the islands tremble freed the team, spread out a chariot housing, and drew the car up on a central stand. Then Zeus who views the wide world took his chair, his golden chair, as underfoot the mighty mountain of Olympos quaked. Alone, apart, sat Hera and Athena speaking never a word to him. He knew their mood and said, Athena, why so gloomy? And Hera, why? 
in war, where men win glory, you have not had to toil to bring down Trojans for whom both hold an everlasting grudge. Such is my animus and so inexorable my hands that all the gods upon Olympos could not in any case deflect or turn them. Fear shook your gracious knees before you saw the nightmare acts of warfare. I can tell you why, and what defeat was sure to come of it, no riding in your chariot back to Olympos, back to your seats here, after my lightning bolt. Zeus fell silent, and they murmured low, Athena and Hera, putting their heads together, meditating the Trojans' fall. Athena held her peace toward Zeus, though a fierce rancor pervaded her, Hera could not contain it, and burst out to him, fearsome as you are, why take that tone with goddesses, my lord? We are well aware how far from weak you are, but we mourn still for the Achaean spearmen if they are now to meet hard fate and die. As you command, we shall indeed abstain from battle, merely, now and again, dropping a word of counsel to the Argives, that all may not be lost through your displeasure. Then Zeus who gathers cloud replied to her, At dawn tomorrow you will see still more, my wide-eyed lady, if you care to see the Lord Zeus in high rage scything that army of Argive spearmen down, for Hector shall not give his prowess respite from the war until the marvellous runner, son of Peleus, rouses beside his ship, when near at hand, around the sterns, in a desperate narrow place, they fight over Patroclo's dead. That way the will of heaven lies. You and your anger do not affect me, you may betake yourself to the uttermost margin of earth and sea, where Iapetos and Kronos rest and never bask in the rays of Aelios who moves all day in heaven, nor rejoice in winds, but lie submerged in Tartaros. You, too, may roam that far, you bitch unparalleled, I'll be indifferent still to your bad temper. Hera whose arms are white as ivory made no reply. Now in the western ocean the shining sun dipped, drawing dark night on over the kind grain-bearing earth, a sundown far from desired by Trojans, but the night came thrice besought and blessed by the Achaeans. Hector at once called Trojans to assembly, leading the way by night back from the ships to an empty field beside the eddying river, a space that seemed free of the dead. The living halted and dismounted there to listen to a speech by Hector, dear to Zeus. He held his lance erect, eleven forearms long with bronze points shining in the air before him as shone, around the shank, a golden ring. Leaning on this, he spoke amid the Trojans, hear me, Trojans, Dardans, and allies. By this time I had thought we might retire to Windy Ilion, after we had destroyed Achaeans and their ships, but the night's gloom came before we finished. That has saved them, Argives and ships, at the sea's edge near the surf. All right, then, let us bow to the Black Knight, and make an evening feast. From the chariot poles unyoke the teams, toss fodder out before them, bring down beeves and fat sheep from the city, and lose no time about it, amber wine and wheat and bread, too, from our halls. Go, gather piles of firewood, so that all night long, until the firstborn dawn, our many fires shall burn and send to heaven their leaping light, that not by night shall the unshorn Achaeans get away on the broad back of the sea. Not by night, and not without combat, either, taking ship easily, but let there be those who take homeward missiles to digest, hit hard by arrows or by spears as they shove off and leap aboard. And let the next man hate the thought of waging painful war on Trojan master horsemen. Honored criers throughout our town shall publish this command, old men with hoary brows, and striplings, all camp out tonight upon the ancient towers, women in every megaron kindle fires, and every sentry keep a steady watch against a night raid on the city, while my troops are in the field. These dispositions, Trojans, are to be taken as I command. And may what I have said tonight be salutary, likewise what I shall say at dawn. I hope with prayer to Zeus and other immortal gods we shall repulse the dogs of war and death brought on us in the black ships. I, this night will guard ourselves, toward morning arm again and wet against the ships the edge of war. I'll see if Diams has the power to force me from the ships, back on the rampart, or if I kill him and take home his gear, wet with his blood. He will show bravery tomorrow if he face my spear advancing. In the first rank, I think, wounded he'll lie with plenty of his friends lying around him at sunup in the morning. Would I were sure of being immortal, ageless all my days, and reverence like Athena and Apollo, as it is sure this day will bring defeat on those of Argos. This was the speech of Hector, and cheers rang out from the Trojans after it. They led from under the yokes their sweating teams, tethering each beside his chariot, then brought down from the city beeves and sheep in all haste, brought down wine and bread as well out of their halls. They piled up firewood and carried out full tally hecatoms to the immortals. Off the plain, the wind bore smoke and savour of roasts into the sky. Then on the perilous open ground of war, in brave expectancy, they lay all night while many campfires burned. 
as when in heaven principal stars shine out around the moon when the night sky is limpid, with no wind, and all the lookout points, headlands, and mountain clearings are distinctly seen, as though pure space had broken through, downward from heaven, and all the stars are out, and in his heart the shepherd sings, just so from ships to river shone before Ilion the Trojan fires. There were a thousand burning in the plain, and round each one lay fifty men in firelight. Horses champed white barley, near the chariots, waiting for dawn to mount her lovely chair, 